Welcome all to um, um, the, the talk about uh, discless booting of uh, Raspberry Pis and uh, more um, in uh, generic uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, 400. You should see them here. Um, who's of you, for example, or has Raspberry Pis at home and works with Raspberry Pis? Yeah, a lot of cat good. I like I'm a good company. <laughs> By the way, yeah, the, I have two of them here. I got uh, two more there. And we'll, and with a little bit of luck, we're also going to use them all in the presentation. Um, as you know, these are these are actually very rare. And uh, the, the big guy actually at the outside of the room that's actually protecting me and my Raspberry Pi. So might you get any ideas? Okay, good. Um, let's get started a little bit. Um, I will tell you also a little bit about myself. What I normally actually this. Um, uh, ramp on course is actually a little bit normally out of my, my comfort zone. I'm normally doing uh, a little bit of other things and that kind of stuff, but actually, this was a really nice project that I picked up actually with my, my sons a time ago. Okay, let's see. First, the introduction. Um, yes. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to tell you where I am, then I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, Raspberry Pi 4 and 400. I do see that a lot of you people actually already know it, so we'll keep that short. Then actually, okay, what were actually the reasons why we started this project? Because actually, yeah, the idea was uh, quite nice. These Raspberry Pis, they are really powerful. Uh, these things are actually eight gigabytes, four CPUs, ARM-based, that kind of stuff. All the world is not Intel only <laughs> nowadays. Uh, we luckily have uh, other processors like these ARMs, like the RIS-5s and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the nice things actually that got introduced in uh, 2020 in November were actually these uh, Raspberry Pis uh, that were encased actually enclosed in a, a keyboard. And they're actually really nice actually to use as a, uh, yeah, a computer for classrooms eh, where you actually don't need to have the big laptops or if you don't want to have desktops, etc. So I'm going to tell you a little about it. Then I'm actually going to show you um, and tell you actually uh, how we actually did solve the problem, that kind of stuff. There are multiple ways actually to do that. There's still some quirks and some open issues. I'm going to try to demo it. Uh, but the nice part is uh, you see I did bring a lot of um, stuff actually here. A little bit of a mini data center, uh, a switch, a uh, Odroid, <laughs> all things on by the way. <laughs> so uh, let's see if we can like, work again. Uh, like with many demos, uh, this is my only option. I do not have a backup plan, so we're going to make it as, uh, yeah, as good as it gets. Good, and then actually uh, for any questions that are left. Good, let's first answer the ex uh, existential question, who am I? Well, I'm uh, Pascal van Dam. I've been a trainer also for Linux Foundation uh, since uh, a long time. Started being a trainer actually in uh, 1999 uh, with uh, Hewlett Packard. I started actually delivering courses for HPOX. A little bit older, uh, the old iron with the um, yeah, propriety uh, Unixes and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also uh, the architect in this case for, uh, for ATOS. I'm uh, doing actually in the Netherlands their uh, Linux and their uh, Kubernetes uh, work and that kind of stuff. Um, next to uh, yeah, actually being in Linux for a long, long time, actually being there since uh, 1991, so even when we had these floppy disks, for example, I was already onboarding it. I did some uh, kernel hacking and that kind of stuff, uh, created a process resource manager and encrypted file system, that kind of stuff. Um, Nowadays, I'm also uh, doing trainings on uh, Kubernetes and also uh, creating, for example, uh, the operators, so uh, the, the deep technical stuff. That's the reason why. Now, this is actually a little bit of a, a challenge for me, but I really like it. Kernel internals, Node.js, and lately actually we developed two courses for Go and Rust. And I'm a proud father of four sons, and the two elders actually now have joined me in the company. They're actually now at the university. And um, one of the, um, yeah, Reasons actually that we started this course is uh, because my elders actually uh, decided during a sabbatical to join me in the company and we had, okay, let's do some really nice and we'd like to do something where we have some common technologies like iSCSI, like NFS, like TFTP boot, and how can we actually integrate that and for example, in a project to boot Raspberry Pis remotely. Okay, let's see. So the Raspberry Pi 4 and now 400. And there were actually the four was introduced in uh, 2019, a successor of the a successful range of the Raspberry Pi, the two, the three, and that kind of stuff. What's really nice actually was that the Raspberry Pi 4 is a lot powerful. Uh, actually, Raspberry Pi as we have it now uh, is actually um, powerful, for example, than laptops that were actually introduced four years ago. Uh, the ARM 8 based, um, nice is actually in 2020, we even got a eight gigabyte model. 
and that really makes it nice because the next project actually had okay i really love these kubernetes actually these raspberry Pis in a kubernetes environment that what would be greater just to have a, a kubernetes that i can just switch on add new uh, nodes actually as kubernetes of as uh, raspberry pi modules etc so that's also what we did now i've got one gigabyte ethernet port in sd card slot two times usb 3 and two times usb 3. What we'll see a little bit later on is that that SD card is actually a little bit of the uh, Achilles heel of these Raspberry Pis. And what we have there is actually uh, you need to put in as an SD card. And even, for example, if you're running uh, Kubernetes on this kind of stuff, the continuous writing, for example, on the etcd database will, will completely wear out these cards. So that's not really something that's really nice. So we need to need something else. You see a lot of people actually nodding, so you know that one. <laughs> The other one came a little bit later in November 2020, and that was actually an RP, um, Raspberry Pi 4, but then enclosed in a keyboard. It was actually based on an upgrade of the SOC, in this case the uh, C0 setting, and that allowed also for higher frequencies. So instead of the base frequency, we could actually step it over 200, even if you were lucky, even more. The drawback was a little bit, they only had 4 gigabytes of RAM. Actually, if you open up such a Raspberry Pi 400, for example, what you see is a major heatsink with a computer on it. And um, one USB port less, because the keyboard has, this actually also needs to be routed. And also, this one had an SD card slot, and actually ideal for running Linux tests. So the only thing what you actually do is you plug in a monitor, you make sure that you put your SD card in it, a mouse, and actually you're completely in business. Okay. Oh well. Also, uh, if you have any questions, uh, let's keep this as interactive as possible. Just raise your hand, and I will uh, give you, uh, and uh, you can actually ask me, and I will try to answer. Good. Okay. <clears throat> so the shortcomings. Now, the first one I'm always running into is these things do not have a real-time clock actually built in. Yeah, that means that when we switch them off, uh, they actually have a, uh, a way to store the time in the file system. Uh, but for example, if the shutdown doesn't work, uh, go really well, actually it means that the RTC, for, for example, the time in your Raspberry Pi will be somewhere in the past and that kind of stuff. Would be actually really nice if they would have a battery backup RTC there, because that would make life a lot easier. Yeah? And for example, with uh, uh, running these things as uh, Kubernetes nodes, for example, that is really mandatory. In the other way, we already told that, the SD cards, they actually prove to be very fragile. And the problem is that the SD cards are normally being used for things like cameras and that kind of stuff. So actually, that's sequentially the right, there's not much reading on that one. If we use them actually in computers and we have a file system like XFS or XT4, for example, or we have, for example, a database actually hammering on that, you see a lot of wear and tear and actually, yeah, yeah the cheap ones, they actually die within a few weeks and the longer ones they die when you do not want it good <clears throat> so the Raspberry Pi foundation on itself also of course have found out that the SD cards were not ideal actually so they also actually uh, improved something and the nice thing about the Pi 4 is that it has its own EEPROM its own boot EEPROM actually there uh, it's actually a bootloader in that one. They can actually upgrade that one fairly easily. And uh, gradually, the last uh, firmware version that we have now is one actually uh, from uh, uh, the 2nd of September, 2022. Um, but uh, gradually, in the past, booting from USB storage was added. There were actually two forms of USB, uh, the mass storage and the normal one. Booting from network using TFTP was added. That's actually what we're going to focus on in this talk. Lately, booting from network using HTTP was added and the nice thing about this form actually is that you can now um, uh, for example um, uh, uh, yeah, imprint as a scribe store your SD card with the um, OS image uh, without actually having a um, yeah uh, having to put it for example in a second computer and write there your SD card so that's actually really nice we're also now working actually on that to see if we can actually boot it directly so that we don't need to have it written first to SD card we're actually using it but we're still in in the investigating that one and the other one but that's only actually for the CM4 and the CM4 is actually the third version that we have of the Raspberry Pi um, they actually allow us to uh, use NVMe devices and uh, to boot from that. On the Pi 4 and the Pi 400, unfortunately, that's not possible. Good. 
challenges. Just so actually, why do we do this? So um, now, the first thing is that we are delivering courses and uh, during the COVID, previous uh, COVID, I was actually allowed to travel a lot and go and actually a lot of time in the island, went to India, uh, South Africa and that kind of stuff. So actually there, uh, you uh, work with people and also there, the uh, systems actually that we use for classes are mostly uh, on the cloud and that kind of stuff. But um, classes like uh, the kernel internals, that's nice to do that actually on a, uh, a public cloud, but yeah, the, the machines get rebooted a lot. Uh, we need to debug stuff. A lot of the clouds actually have their own kernels optimized and that kind of stuff. So actually, this works much better with physical machines. Yeah, so actually having a Raspberry Pi 4 or file that actually really nice works with that. We have another class, for example, for kernel management, exactly the same. That works best if we have a small machine that we actually can do with the widow, actually what's there, not any ballooning in the public cloud, etc. And this was a nice one. Um, yeah, next to uh, being an IT engineer, I'm also doing stuff actually uh, with children's coaching for uh, children. And I'm also, for example, teaching uh, computer science or ancient Greek for classes of uh, highly gifted children. And actually, I had to have them work, for example, with Logo. Actually, these um, Raspberry Pi 400s are really actually nice to set up. But actually, we'd like to make it very simple so that uh, the uh, teachers also can do that. So I would like to have a fast setup. Actually, we plug it in. And once it actually plug it in, it play it plugs in, it should actually know, okay, I'm, for example, this Raspberry Pi 400, and we're going to, for example, boot it up with a uh, Ubuntu distribution. Another one, for example, we're going to plug it in, and it will actually uh, start up with a Pi OS distribution, for example, and then load it, for example, with a uh, kernel Rust uh, implementation, etc. Central management and important, uh, not relying on the SD cards uh, or USB storage. USB storage works better, but still uh, the little things actually also in classroom, for example, they get actually uh, uh, um, uh, people will lose them and that kind of stuff. So uh, we really would like to do it without any storage. So <clears throat> the second project was actually nice, and actually I um, um, offered this also to uh, the um, uh, uh, KubeCon and that kind of stuff. What really would be nice, and actually also had to teach this, for example, in uh, Kubernetes classes, and you know, in the uh, public cloud, uh, we can actually do something called horizontal uh, node scaling. That means, for example, if I would like to scale up my cluster, add all the uh, extra worker nodes, I can directly do that. And what would now be nice if I could do this actually with Raspberry Pi 4s? And the nice thing about these guys, actually not this one, but there's actually Raspberry Pi inside. Uh, we can actually um, put a PoE uh, plus hat on that. So it actually means they get fed by the network. Not only that, that actually means that we can start them up, power them up over the network, we can power them down. And that means actually that I could create, uh, for example, a controller inside of Kubernetes, just a process, which I'm going to say I would like now to scale up my cluster. And it automatically actually starts up, opens up uh, one of these power EE ports, for example, in this one, powers it up, waits actually till the Raspberry Pi automatically sends its boot request, and boots with the image actually to directly being able to connect and add another node to it. So. So actually to deploy Raspberry Pi Kubernetes uh, cluster on demand, scale up and scale down, now scale up by just not doing more than actually uh, enabling the power on a PoE plus port and scale down actually by disabling the PoE. And of course, first we need to do that in a nice way. So we're going to shut down the node and actually uh, just uh, scale it off, etc. And then actually uh, powering off the port. <coughs> Good. So, how does a Raspberry Pi actually boot? No. Good. <clears throat> when powered on, what actually happens here with the Raspberry Pi is that it uh, starts up. You see these red flash, uh, light flashing. If it flashes too much, then you know that something is wrong with your SD card or with your boot process. Uh, the boot EEPROM, uh, sorry, I forgot an E here. Uh, handles the boot order. Yeah, that actually, uh, since um, 2020, we are actually able to uh, configure that. You can use, in this case, the uh, so-called RPI EEPROM config. I will show you that a little bit later. And there you can actually change the boot order. Normally, it's actually uh, default on starting from the SD card. And what you actually can do is uh, put a number there. Now, for example, this is F241. And that sounds a little strange, but actually we're going to read it from 
uh, and this gets right to left from my side if I'm in the front of you, so your, so your view. One meets boot from uh, the, uh, the uh, SD card, four means boot from the USB card, and one me of uh, the two means uh, boot from the TFTP from the network. Why do I do that? Well, quite simple. This will always help me, for example, to intervene in the boot. For example, I need to flash the, uh, the ROM outside of uh, the uh, network boot and that kind of stuff, or I need to do some other stuff. If I actually have first let it um, connect to the network, as soon as it actually finds my TFTP server, it will directly boot from that one. So that way actually. And the F actually means try it an infinitive time. So uh, quite simple, it will try this complete boot order. It will do one, four, two, and again, one, two, four, etc. Always. So that way we can make it a little bit uh, field proof. Good. When the network boot is actually uh, yeah, uh, the one that's been uh, selected, then a TFTP request will be done. And actually that's really nice, and we'll show you that in a few moments. Let's see, I don't have one. Oh, I have one happy. I'm going to show you that because I need to change my screen. <laughs> the um, TFTP request will be done, and I will actually look for a, uh, a directory that's actually named after CPU serial number. Yeah, you can find that one, and I'll show you in the, uh, when I actually have my uh, laptop ready. Uh, when you do, for example, a cut proc CPU info, you will see there the serial number. And that serial number, that's actually where the TFTP will do action and check where it needs its file. So uh, with normal PCs, for example, uh, they advertise, for example, their MAC address, and it actually will look there for the uh, boot files. In this case, it will actually look for the serial. You can change that if you would like to, but I really lo lo love this one because this is actually means that uh, I can recognize each and every individual uh, pie for that one. So down, it down, downloads the config.pent text uh, that actually uh, 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 consists of some of the device tree uh, um, the, the, the declarations, for example. It, it um, sets, for example, what the uh, speed of the CPU is. It sets, for example, the, um, um, yeah, the, in which, which kind of HDMI mode it needs to start up, etc., etc. Then it also downloads command line and text. That will actually tell which kernel needs to be booted. Um, that will actually um, also tell, for example, what command line options are needed. These are very important because uh, the whole goal is literally that we are going to try to boot the Raspberry Pi completely over the network without any local storage. So uh, things that we could use for, for example, full NFS. Uh, the problem only with NFS is that uh, it doesn't scale through the bad. Uh, NFS is not something, for example, that I would use for my etcd database of Kubernetes to run on. So I actually chose in this case for iSCSI disks. And also going to show you that. So actually in the command line text, text, you will find actually the command line for the kernel to boot up with uh, the uh, target ID, the uh, uh, target initiator from the iSCSI, and actually where to find, in this case, the iSCSI provider, for example. Plus a lot of other stuff, uh, to either to have a quiet boot or to have a more noisy boot and that kind of stuff. But also, for example, a panic equals 15. They'll actually tell, for example, if something goes wrong. And within 15, min uh, 15 seconds, uh, we can actually not uh, get a boot uh, root volume, for example. Then it'll actually restart and we'll try again. Okay, after that, the kernel will be loaded. The initial RAM disk will be loaded. And then actually the kernel will be started. We'll boot from the initial RAM disk. And then actually later on, it will actually uh, pick up the iSCSI uh, disk and boot from there further on in the stack stage boot. Good. Okay. So the kernel is downloaded. Init ID is downloaded. The kernel is started. And now, what are we needing for the solution? Okay. Um, I need to boot, because yeah, the whole boot principle of the Raspberry Pi is actually to boot off TFTP. So what I need is a TFTP server. Of course, I can use uh, the uh, one from Peter Andrew, for example. Uh, another one that's really nice actually to use is the one that's already available in the Nest Mask. Yeah, the good part is actually that will give me one ADHP server, so I get my IP addresses. It will give me TFTP, and it will actually give me a uh, caching DNS, my, uh, DNS server. So also all the pies, for example, that get booted automatically get a name in my DNS. So that's actually one solution, which is really small 
and actually fits them all. So that's the reason why we chose actually for Dean S mask. And the nice thing is actually this one. And again, this is not a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Um, the reason why I chose this one is actually this is an Odroid, so definitely still ARM. Uh, this one has the uh, ability to have a NVMe disk actually inside, so he has a two terabyte NVMe disk that will actually have all the logicalized CUSI disks for the Raspberry Pi on it. If that would be possible in Raspberry Pi, for example, I could also use a Raspberry Pi for that, or for example, I could use Raspberry Pi and add, for example, a, uh, uh, a uh, <coughs> USB stick or, for example, a uh, SSD disk to it. Good. Now we need a nice CUSI server. That's also on this one. And I'm going to uh, demo that a little bit of actually going to show you actually how this works in, in, in a few moments. And that nice CUSI server actually yeah, um, serves the disks out, the root disks of all the um, uh, Raspberry Pis for that, that are attached to that one. The nice thing actually we're making use in this case of Logical Volume Manager 2. And of course, there are more ways because yeah, um, Important, of course, is that we try to create a kind of a template for our um, uh, Raspberry Pis to provision. And for our desktops, what we actually pick up is a Ubuntu image, for example. We need to clean it a little bit. We need to actually add some extra drivers to that one. And then actually we need to copy everything over to, uh, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, to the logical disk, to the iSCSI one. We created actually an Ansible playbook for you for that. So I'm actually going to show you that also. And uh, another nice thing of actually using LVM2 is that uh, my, um, I have the choice for the iSCSI actually to have my um, devices, my logical devices being files, or for example, having them as logical volumes. Now we chose actually to use logical volumes in this case. And uh, you know, one, uh, quite simple, it means that I do not have the file system interface, so I have less overhead. And the second part is really nice. With LVM2, for example, I can actually create snapshots of existing uh, logical volumes. And that means, for example, that I can have a template and I can actually snapshot this template and actually have another Raspberry Pi, for example, work from that one. And that will cost me one less time to copy it. And the second one, actually, that will uh, uh, give me a faster uh, startup and actually less uh, space of uh, users of uh, uh, storage space. Good. Then there's another one that's actually nice because what we have now is actually a, um, uh, a system, uh, a Raspberry Pi that can boot from TFTP. It will get this kernel, uh, yeah, because actually that will be on a uh, TFTP actually file system. I'm going to show you a little bit of a drawing in a little bit. And um, then actually we do have the iSCSI device, so that will be given, that's great. But there's one problem, because um, these Raspberry Pis, they have this, and depending on what kind of a distribution you're actually running, if you're, for example, if Ubuntu, then your firmware files, your kernel, and all your device tree files, they're actually in boot firmware. That means that boot firmware is actually copied to your TFTP server. That's nice. But if I'm going to actually, okay, <laughs> no it is. Uh, if I'm actually going to upgrade, for example, the kernel, yeah, it means that these files, yeah, the RAM disk, the kernel, and maybe even the device tree files, for example, they get updated. But yeah, uh, TFTP is a one-way uh, uh, road in this case. So I need to make a way actually to copy back. So actually what we do, this boot NFS uh, of this boot uh, TFTP uh, boot firmware, we actually also mount that as NFS. And that means, for example, if I'm going to uh, upgrade the uh, kernel, it will automatically, uh, yeah, uh, put these things on the NFS uh, file, shared file system, and uh, that's actually also directly available on the TFTP. So. Um, then another one, and that's less needed for these ones, for example, but uh, we use that a lot for the Pi 4s, for example, when we actually uh, deploy them uh, in a Kubernetes environment. I am um, making use of Cloud Init, uh, which is actually a, a tool that has also been used by the big public clouds and that kind of stuff. And with that, we actually can post config or uh, Unix, uh, Linux distribution. Now what we can change here, for example, is the host name, because I'm coming from a template, and that means actually that from the start, actually all my Raspberry Pis will have the same name. That doesn't work very well. So what I'm going to do is actually for every Raspberry Pi that I'm going to deploy, there will be a special directory with uh, the two famous uh, cloud init files, uh, user data, metadata, metadata containing the host name, for example, user data containing all the items that actually uh, configure the system, for example, changes in the users that need to be made, uh, uh, adding users, adding keys, uh, that kind of stuff. Eventually, for example, um, adding logos, uh, banners, issues, uh, maybe some software, so all that kind of stuff is actually possible. 
And also here, this cloud init, what we actually do is in the command line, we actually refer to cloud init in this case to get it from this web server. Okay, the next thing that we need to do, this is nice, and now uh, I'm working with a template, but how do I get this template? Uh, so actually what we do is we actually um, uh, installing a um, Raspberry Pi in the normal way. For example, with an SD card, we need to do it once, or for example, with a USB um, uh, stick. We boot it up, uh, we install the software that we need. Uh, so for example, if I have for my classes in Go or Rust, for example, I need stuff with uh, a VI, for example, completely configured for Rust. I need to have the latest Rust compiler, for example, and all that stuff we actually put in. If I need a special desktop, for example, for kids, there's also what I'm going to put in, in onto it. That will be my base. But yeah, we also would like actually to have a distribution that is stable. So I would not like to have, for example, a single file system. I would like to have uh, 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 yeah, everything neat and clean in logical volumes. So actually what we do then is we have an Ansible playbook and that will actually um, be um, run on a remote system. Then we'll go to the Raspberry Pi and then actually mount the iSCSI device and then actually rsync almost everything over with some changes. And also, for example, they're making sure that the logical volume manager is being um, used there. So we have far on a different file system, as well on a different file system, far log, far log security, all that kind of stuff. Okay. <coughs> we um, chose two distributions. We actually work them more also with, for example, uh, uh, the um, uh, Ubuntu, the previous ones like 2104 and 2210. This one is actually now uh, the most stable one that we have. Um, PyOS 64 is uh, also very nice. The nice thing with PyOS 4, and unfortunately I cannot demo it because the um, HDMI um, cable uh, doesn't like the output of my uh, other <laughs> Raspberry Pi 400, but that one, for example, is running uh, KD right nicely. And also with some of the acceleration actually that the GPU inside of the RPI 400, for example, does. A reason, so for choosing for PyOS, uh, 64, for example, is using the um, acceleration, for example, uh, of the graphics, what you have, for example, in uh, Mozilla and, uh, the, and Chrome, no, sorry, not in Mozilla, what you have, for example, in Chrome and that kind of stuff. For Kubernetes, we use the 2204 most. Okay. <coughs> so, let me see. We need to add a little bit. My not that one. My laptop refuses to um, mirror the screen. It could be that my laptop is a 4K and this screen is actually a, a 2K. See if I put it in this screen, then I have to make it a little bit smaller. Yeah, apologies for this. Let's make it even more smaller. to do it a little bit with some apologies. Okay, what we actually have here, this is, uh, for example, in this case, the Odroid, that's actually um, um, uh, doing the function of um, the iSCSI uh, server, the Cloud Inet server, and the TFTP boot server, and of course also uh, uh, DNS mask with uh, DNS and that kind of stuff. Um, with our lab, we actually have this on a uh, running on a NAS, for example. We're using a QNAP for that one, but you can actually use anything. Uh, what I actually did is all port all the functionality in such a small system. Okay, first thing uh, that we actually have is the TFTP boot. And that will actually, in this case, uh, provide the kernel and all the uh, uh, boot files and also all the device tree files, for example, to the Pi 400 or the Pi 4 over the network. The other way around, 
we also have one line because quite simply when we upgrade actually the kernel all the upgraded uh, images the upgraded init id actually needs to be written back in the same directory here in the tftp boot um, then another stream actually that we have is the cloud init so once the kernel actually has been booted uh, um, in one of the first stages actually what it will do is it will execute cloud init that will actually look for the uh, user data file and then actually apply all the customizations actually to the image and of course uh, the iSCSI which actually is providing the uh, real root disk actually for the system okay good Okay, QuickX, yes, we still have them. Um, what happens, and we'll see that actually when I uh, demo that, we'll give two demos, one actually for uh, the um, uh, Pi 400, see how it actually boots into Ubuntu and that kind of stuff. We'll check then also on the um, Odroad actually how that works. And the second one will be, we'll try to actually boot up uh, two of these guys. They actually will completely uh, set themselves up, so they're completely empty. Uh, the Pi 400 actually here has already been set up, so uh, we don't see too much of them, but actually that it just works. Um, but quirks that we have, for example, is in the cloud in it, sometimes we run into a uh, race condition. That means that most of the times actually, and we might see that here with the uh, Pi, for, uh, Pi 4s, for example, uh, we see that um, it, uh, it does have actually access to the Nginx, uh, to the web server actually for the cloud init files but still isn't able to do that and actually will fall back then to the um, fallback resource and actually means that we will still be um, uh, stuck with the old host name that's actually on the template. The way to fix that manually is actually just logging onto the system and then for example do a cloud init clean for example and then that will actually fix that one also. And another one that we have for example is um, um, for example, Ubuntu is there uh, notorious for. Uh, it has the option actually to uh, do all the updates actually of uh, security features. And sometimes that doesn't go really well. It actually leaves out certain drivers. And what, of course, is uh, disastrous for or set up is if the LVM2 driver is gone or the iSCSI driver is gone, that actually means that uh, the uh, system cannot boot again. We can easily fix this also uh, by just copying, for example, the files of the uh, previous backup files uh, on the uh, NAS device, or in this case on the uh, boot supplier. Good, let's see if we can get it demoed. Okay, I need to do this um, a little bit switching uh, one and uh, forward and back. Again, apologies for that, but let's do that. This is my Raspberry Pi. I'm going to actually now unplug it from the um, uh, power. So here it is. The second thing that I'm going to do now is I'm going to plug this one off. Now we are good. Now if I plug this one in, then the Raspberry Pi will get power. And hopefully we'll get an image in a few moments. Yes, here it is. I'm going to this is the new um, boot screen actually. This is uh, a fairly new actually um, uh, firmware. This one has already the HTTP boot in it. Uh, we're not going to use that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the escape key here to, <coughs> and again, um, it's not looking re very readable, uh, but what it does here, you see here the boot order, in this case uh, the USB. Then you see here it tries again for the USB, it says that it tries the SD card and then now it actually goes into the boot process over the network. You saw the TFTP boot, you saw that it actually got its own um, IP address. It did find the IP address of the TFTP server. And this is of course the uh, Chroma screen that we have that is actually that now uh, it's going to boot the kernel. This shouldn't take too long, but every time that you look at it, it's uh, taking its time. Okay. This means that the kernel has been booted <coughs> and um, in a few seconds, we should actually see that the um, video card, the video adapter is actually um, getting screen output again. OK. 
Okay, down it goes. Again, here you see it booting and goes a little bit fast, but um, you have to believe me. <laughs> this is actually the cloud image. You can see that here with the, the, um, uh, the pluses and that kind of stuff. On the top of it, yeah, you could have seen, um, if you read very carefully, um, uh, the um, uh, attaching of the ISQC uh, devices, uh, actually uh, the uh, volume groups actually being activated. That's actually now coming here. Now it's going to start up the um, desktop environment. Now you see the cursor of the desktop environment and here we have a nice 2204. And again, you can check it. There's no USB card, there's no SD card in it. This is just booting actually just from this cable, from this switch and from that apparatus. Okay. <clears throat> What I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch back again to my laptop and I'm going to try to get on board of uh, the um, uh, Odroid so actually we can see the uh, logs of the DNS mask and also show you that and we can see for example what happens on side of the Raspberry Pi. Okay, <coughs> let's do that. And again, it's a little bit unfortunate that the screen doesn't work. Okay, here we have it. typing a little bit in the blind, so forgive me my typing mistakes. Okay, so I have to look over it sometime. Now I'm actually on the Odroid. Um, let me see if I can make this a little bit more readable. work that way okay we have to do that this way again here this is just the um, normal login screen what I'm going to do now I'm going to um, for example okay that works better <coughs> this is readable this is my uh, DNS mask print conf uh, we'll see uh, some special stone stuff actually in this one this is just the address I'm listing on. This is actually the um, Ethernet device that's actually here. Um, here I have a private range, in this case from 2 to 100. These will be given for 24 hours. Uh, this will be the router, which will be that thing itself, <coughs> and putting up the NTP server. Um, the good part is this one normally does do have a battery backed up RTC clock. Unfortunately, it did not survive the uh, travel with the plane, so I need to check in that one. Um, the DNS server, the net mask, etc. Then what I do here, <coughs> I actually put in the um, different... Um, let me go a little bit underneath of it. So here <coughs> we have, for example, um, some of the uh, DSP hosts. Actually, I'm going to go, um, uh, fix, for example, the MAC address to a name. I'm not going to use that here. This one actually does, but that doesn't work for me. Here, I'm going to lock all the communication, actually the DNS mask, and uh, for example, for the TFTP protocol, that's very handy, actually to see what's happening, to see if actually the Raspberry Pi picks it up, to see which uh, files, for example, are getting sent and that kind of stuff. Uh, for example, if I didn't uh, prepare my TFTP boot, for example, for the serial number of the Raspberry Pi, I could see that, that it couldn't find a file, for example. Here with, I'm actually enabling TFTP and also setting the directory. We're going to look into that a little bit further. And actually what I'm doing here is 
this needs to be specifically there for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, normally we do don't do things, for example, for x86 boots or your fi boots, for example. But by using this Pexy Services Zero Raspberry Pi boot, we can actually recognize or have TFTP recognize uh, Raspberry Pi is actually do a TFTP request. Okay. So here, this is the TFTP boot directory. Unfortunately, this is um, a horrible color actually to read. What you can see here, these are actually the um, um, serial numbers of the CPU per this. So you see here a few of them. You see sometimes a little bit of a different name. That's actually why I copied a snapshot, for example. Uh, where can you get these? Well, quite simple. Let's see, for example, first what the IP address was that we uh, booted from. So, so which Pi actually booted from us? Okay. No, I made a mistake. Let's see that. You see here uh, the uh, TFTB boot process with all the options that have been sent. What I'm looking for is actually the IP address. Let me see that. I believe this one came in at uh, 712. If nothing is actually there on the other line. That's the, no, that's my start. It's a request for 73. So most probably we are 73. Okay, now I've logged on to my Raspberry Pi and the DTC is the N05. And what we can see here, for example, if I pick up the FSTOP, you can see here nicely, see here, these are actually um, the file systems that have been uh, created um, here, important. You see here the NFS boot of the TCP boot with exactly this number. And that means actually that the serial number of this Raspberry Pi, you can see that here is indeed this number. You have to strip off, by the way, the first numbers. So here's 6692DE2F, that's actually my serial number. And so every Raspberry Pi, when it boots off the USDP, it will look for files in a directory that's been called after this serial number. Good. <coughs> and if we go, for example, in this case, this is a Ubuntu one. So you can see here, all the files that are in the TFTP, oh, well, that doesn't look like it. Okay. You see here, all the files that are there in the TFTP boot directory, and by NFS, they've been synchronized actually with the boot server. And you see here, for example, uh, for an update for a new uh, EEPROM. And this is also possible. We could, for example, put a new uh, Pi EEPROM, for example, uh, package here. And when that's actually been picked up by the boot, it will first upgrade this EEPROM and then actually do the normal boot and that kind of stuff. Here you'll find the RAM disk, all the overlays, and a little bit under that, you'll find the, and here we have the command line pen text. That's also nice, actually, to look into that. This looks impressive. What you see here, it's um, in this case a Z-swap enabled. That's actually for the new Ubuntu. They have that one. Um, here it's getting actually interesting. It's the console is TTY1. Rootfs type is XFS. We did change that. 
Uh, this is actually uh, telling me that my root disk will be on uh, VG root, LV root. This is my initiator. And this is my target. So actually there I can get my iSQC devices from. And in this case, LUN1, for example, I could also have multiple LUNs if I would like to, for example, for the Kubernetes one, we actually add another disk for the uh, file containers of file Docker, for example. And here we have then the um, read writes and the elevator deadline, if the root waits, it waits actually for root actually to be uh, active. Fix the RTC, this is the fix actually uh, to get the uh, latest time actually on the file system uh, when the system actually uh, stops. Panic is five, if within 15 seconds we do not have a uh, uh, mountable root disk, now we actually come to re uh, reboot. And this one is the cloud um, inner one. So actually the um, provider is no cloud net. And then actually from this one, which is actually the IP address of the Nginx server there, we actually going to in this directory uh, get the user data and the metadata files. Okay. So that's how a 400 actually boots and how we did do this. Okay, let's go a little bit back. See where we are now. I'm on the other road again, that's good. Okay, so the other stuff on the other road, we can find in var www. Let's see, not yet. Uh, yes. That would be a nice one, yes. No, I don't have it installed. <laughs> now, the bad of actually uh, the, uh, the bad luck is actually I did have a second uh, monitor actually also to show me that, but I didn't bring that with me. So in this case, we see, see here the different systems. Let's pick up the five. Here we have the user data. There's a lot of stuff actually here. Um, what we actually have here is so the um, preserved hostname. That means that we're going to reset the hostname. And normally we would have to reset the, the hostname actually here from the template. Here I'm actually going to define all the users that need to be created. <laughs> and at the end, we're actually doing one more trick. Uh, let me see. This is all the users. And then we have here run command. And that actually um, uh, downloads a script. And actually, that's the last uh, configuration that what we actually could not express ourselves in cloud in it. So in this case, this does the following. So I'm going back to this one, then I'm cloud in it. Let's see what we have here. Yep. Okay. For example, what this one does is actually uh, putting a banner and then also make that actually readable when you're actually using a console, for example. The other thing that it does, it makes sure that the iSCSI, because that's also coming from the template, huh? the iSCSI initiator is actually being rewritten, that kind of stuff. We're going to delete. In this case, the old um, uh, registry actually from the iSCSI devices. We're doing some um, check here, the CPU info, because uh, we also have the old FSTAP entry actually from uh, the template, the Raspberry Pi actually that was used to template it. So we need to change the uh, serial number, put that in SFTAP, 
and then actually the last thing that uh, in this case user data does is reboot it again it will then reboot with the new host name it will reboot them with the correct uh, ISQ uh, initiator and that kind of stuff and then actually then we're in business good one more thing for this one This is actually then for Playbook, uh, which my uh, uh, eldest son actually has created uh, um, when I asked him. This is, will actually uh, pick up a Raspberry Pi where we actually have installed uh, a template um, Ubuntu or a template Pi OS, for example. And it will then actually transfer that to a iSCSI device that we can actually use as a template. So I'm just going to do it on a high level. Actually. What we do here is we are going to um, check it. Then we're going to do uh, the disk layout. So actually going to um, describe everything. And let me show you how we do that. Everything with rules. Those of you who did attend the previous um, um, talk here in this room, the guy was already talking a lot about Ansible and that kind of stuff. And a lot of what he talked about, you can also see here. Um, so we go to disk layout as a rule. Then we go to tasks and then we go to main. Okay. A few things that we do here. First, of course, is uh, making sure that we get the ice in that one. Then actually creating the volume groups. And once we've done that, creating the file systems, we have a, a special dictionary actually that creates all the files and we can actually customize that kind of stuff. Um, we are going to um, write everything in a, a temporary Everstep file. Then we're actually going to um, write it back in the write format. And then, of course, we're going to um, pick up the serial number and also put that, in this case, in the Everstep. So that is actually quite simple. What we're actually doing in this case is uh, the, the R-Sync uh, to the new, um, yeah, the R-Sync is what we do here. Uh, we actually write it then uh, to the iSCSI device that we have. And then it's quite simple. Then actually we can copy that iSCSI device. Uh, you can just do that by DD. You can also make a snapshot from of it and then actually have that one uh, attached to your Pi. Okay, let me show one more thing. This was the Pi 400. I'm going to hurt it a little bit, so I'm going to say I don't like this. Okay. All we're going to do now is and see if it works. I'm going to provision one of the Pi 400s. problem is most probably that the screen is not so readable let's see that and the good part is this one has a power button this not starting okay there it goes this one has a little bit of a older uh, bootloader as you can see no, actually not it's the same as new one, but this one actually directly starts. Uh, you can see here that it tries to boot from the uh, USB. That one won't work. So in a few moments, we'll actually go over to TFTP again. Okay, link is ready, it says. You see. <laughs> <laughs> Not a time. You see yeah, that it actually tries to find the uh, boot images by actually yeah, looking for the um, uh, the serial number. This is again the Chroma screen. And what we see here after it, it will actually boot up the iSCSI again. And uh, what it does here, in contrast to the Raspberry Pi front, which was already um, in initialized actually, 
Uh, when we are a little bit lucky, this one will actually um, uh, initialize itself using cloud init, so it will actually boot twice. And unfortunately, the screen is uh, not readable. <laughs> and I cannot change that, unfortunately. Again, it's, uh, as long as the screen is calling, everything is okay. Okay, here we have it. And the good part is that this is actually how we then also add, for example, uh, Raspberry Pis as nodes to our cluster. It goes really fast. Here you can see uh, with the pluses, this is actually the cloud in it that is running. You see multiple um, sections actually here. So this actually means this is the initial one. Let's see how far it comes. So if it reboots, then actually it's okay and it did do its job. If it doesn't reboot, it means we have this race condition. Okay. And there it goes. So this is cloud init. Uh, we're having the final reboot. Uh, what it actually did now is it changed the ISCSI uh, uh, initiator back to what's actually used for this system, named after those name. It did change the ever stop, uh, so that actually the uh, boot firmware, for example, is now connected to its own NFS directory on the uh, TFTP boot. And then it actually reboots again. And now I have to wait. And there it goes. But it in, yeah, let's say um, 80 seconds or so, we can have a new node actually there. And actually using an Ansible playbook, what we do is we actually pick up uh, the new node. We actually go back to the master node, request there the join key, and then actually we directly join this one. And that means that Kubernetes on itself, for example, needs two more minutes actually to pull in all the images, and then actually everything can be just used for production. Here it goes again. Are there any questions already? Please. You did put a lot of work in, in all of this. Are you publishing? Um, yes, yes, definitely. I will uh, make sure that I, um, 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 I already was busy with it last, um, um, last night. I did miss the uh, Guinness. <laughs> a lot of you all did it also. But yeah, yes, I'm going to put it on GitHub so that you can all uh, get, get this kind of stuff. But yeah, you're welcome. And a lot of people actually work with this kind of stuff, but not many people actually have done the iSCSI one. And actually the biggest problem that most people face is actually uh, when a um, kernel gets upgraded, how I'm going to actually fix that. And actually we did it with NFS, for example. Uh, it's not the most elegant way, but actually it works like a charm. Um, the other way, for example, um, yeah, what I really would like to do is uh, put some more effort in and, for example, have this one function as a um, NTP server so that all the Raspberry Pis actually directly when they come up, they do have the actually uh, using other technology and uh, actually making the best of uh, these Raspberry Pis because they're really great work and great toys actually to work with. More questions? Good. Now, you can see it's online. Huh? Now it actually has its own logo and that kind of stuff. If you read very carefully, you can actually see his host name. But Good. How's performance if you compare with running from an SD card and the... Uh, oh, that's a very good question. Um, if I, um, with an SD card, for example, uh, depending on um, uh, uh, one from Alibaba or one from uh, <laughs> um, the, the uh, AM, how do you call it, uh, the Samsung ones, for example, uh, the, 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 the premium ones, you get 80 to 90 megabytes per second. Uh, on this one with iSCSI, for example, and again, it is just a one gigabyte, so there's not really super, so the processors in these are actually a little bit more powerful than in the Raspberry Pi, but I get some uh, 220 megabytes per second read, uh, 220 megabytes per, per second write. So for Kubernetes, that works. More questions? Mm, yeah, n not to, you, you could do something like it because uh, the question was not is it possible to have a single disk actually yeah, a single um, and then you can do two things a single template or really a single disk. A single disk, so that you can make updates and inspect the phone. Yeah, know. what you could do have uh, in this case we chose for LVM two, so yeah, you can actually create one disk and actually give the older ones actually a snapshot of that disk. 
Yeah, so they still have their, because they need to have their own storage, of course. Yeah? These are not containers, but uh, they need to have their own storage. And you could have, and another way that you could do, for example, is um, overlay it with a, um, a temp file system, for example, a ROM disk or something that could open. Well, my choice would be actually do something indeed, um, have one a real disk, have the other ones actually snapshots from that one. And give them some extra space, for example, um, you know, 10 gigabytes, for example, so that they can make the changes. And later on, for example, for some of them, you can even merge them back if you'd like to. You said that there was a performance difference between iSCSI and NFS or Kubernetes. Yes. What is the disk access patterns that make that the case? Yeah, what you have with, uh, that's really nice actually to see. And you see it more, for example, when you have, and um, um, we can also do these things actually with high available Kubernetes clusters, for example. Um, etcd is a key value store and that means that it actually makes really fast um, updates and actually the whole idea is that uh, etcd doesn't go and search for example what was the, uh, the next thing that I need to write it actually tries to each time write in a different place in that kind of stuff and that kind of things is actually horrible for, for an sd card and in this case for iSCSI um, yeah we don't see the difference for nfs yes for nfs you? yeah sorry yeah you said SD. yeah because okay. uh, you have all these uh, ops team you have the file system that kind of stuff uh, um, if you have a really big NFS, you should get to get it to work. But actually, we had okay, let's do it as it actually is supposed to do. Uh, normally, you, do, you don't run actually SD database on NFS also, and that's why we actually chose for yeah a normal logical volume. More questions? A very good question, by the way. Perhaps <laughs> uh, I should declare who I work for. Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> good. More questions? Okay, then let's round it up. Many thanks for your attention. Really love it. It's uh, yeah, late on the day and that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, thank you.